fall had shattered a continent. Forests had burned, the firestorms lighting the horizon in every direction, bathing crimson the heaving ash-filled clouds blanketing the sky. The conflagration had seemed unending, world devouring, and through it all could be heard the screams of a god. Pain gave birth to rage, rage to poison, an infection sparing no one. Scattered survivors remained, reduced to savagery, wandering a landscape pocked with huge craters now filled with murky, lifeless water, the sky churning endlessly above them. Kinship had been dismembered, love had proved a burden too costly to carry. They ate what they could, often each other, and scanned the ravaged world around them with rapacious intent. One figure walked alone, wrapped in rotting rags. He was of average height, his features blunt and unprepossessing. There was a dark cast to his face, a heavy inflexibility in his eyes. He walked as if gathering suffering unto himself, unmindful of its vast weight, walked as if incapable of yielding, of denying the gifts of his own spirit. In the distance, ragged bands eyed the figure as he strode, step by step across what was left of the continent that would one day be called Corallery. Hunger might have driven them closer, but there were no fools left among the survivors of the fall, and so they maintained a watchful distance, their curiosity dulled by fear, for the man was an ancient god, and he walked among them. Beyond the suffering he absorbed, Karul would have willingly embraced their broken souls, yet he had fed, was feeding, and the blood spilled onto this land. And the truth was this, the power born of that would be needed. In Karul's wake, men and women killed men, killed women, killed children. Dark slaughter was the river the Elder God rode. Elder Gods embodied a host of harsh and pleasant trees. The foreign god had been torn apart in his descent to earth. He had come down in pieces, in streaks of flame. His pain was fire, screams and thunder, a voice that had been heard by half the world. Pain and outrage, and cruel reflected grief. It would be a long time before the foreign god could begin to reclaim the remaining fragments of its life, and so begin to unveil its nature. Karul feared that day's arrival. From such a shattering could only come madness. The summoners were dead, destroyed by what they had called down upon them. There was no point in hating them. No need to conjure up images of what they had in truth deserved by way of punishment. They had, after all, been desperate. Desperate enough to part the fabric of chaos, to open a way into an alien, remote realm, to then lure a curious god of that realm closer, ever closer to the trap they had prepared. The summoners sought power, all to destroy one man. The Elder God has crossed the ruined continent, had looked upon the still living flesh of the fallen God, had seen the unearthly maggots that crawled forth from that rotting, pulsing meat and broken bone, had seen what those maggots flowered into. Even now, as he reached the battered shoreline of Jakuraku, the ancient sister continent to Corallri, they wheeled above him on their broad black wings. Sensing the power within him, they were hungry for its taste. But a strong god could ignore the scavengers that trailed in his wake, and Karul was a strong god. Temples had been raised in his name. Blood 
had for generations soaked countless altars. The nascent cities were wreathed in the smoke of forges, pyres, the red glow of humanity's dawn. The first empire had risen on a continent half a world away from where Karul now walked. An empire of humans born from the legacy of the Talan Imas. But it had not been alone for long. Here on Jakuraku, in the shadow of long dead Khachan Shamala ruins, another empire had emerged. Brutal, a devourer of souls, its ruler was a warrior without equal. Karul had come to destroy him, had come to snap the chains of 12 million slaves. Even the jagged tyrants had not commanded such heartless mastery over their subjects. No, it took a mortal human to achieve this level of tyranny over his kin. Two other elder gods were converging on the Calorian Empire. The decision had been made. The three, last of the elders, would bring to a close this High King's despotic rule. Karul could sense his companions. Both were close. Both had been comrades once. But they all, Karul included, had changed, had drifted far apart. This would mark the first conjoining in millennia. He could sense a fourth presence as well, a savage ancient beast following his spur, a beast of the earth, of winter's frozen breath, a beast with white fur bloodied, wounded almost unto death by the fall, a beast with but one surviving eye to look upon the destroyed land that had once been its home long before the Empire's rise. Trailing, but coming no closer, and Karul well knew it would remain a distant observer to all that was about to occur. The Elder God could spare it no sorrow, yet was not indifferent to its pain. We each survive as we must, and when time comes to die, we find our places of solitude. The Kalorian Empire has spread to every shoreline of Jakuriku, yet Karul saw no one as he took his first steps inland. Lifeless wastes stretched out on all sides. The air was grey with ash and dust the skies overhead churning like lead in a smith's cauldron. The Elder God experienced the first breath of unease, sidling chill across his soul. Above him, the God-spawned scavengers cackled as they wailed. A familiar voice spoke in Karul's mind. Brother, I am upon the North Shore. And I the West. Are you troubled? I am, all is, dead, incinerated. The heat remains deep beneath the beds of ash, ash and bone. A third voice spoke. Brothers, I am come from the south, where once dwelt the cities, all destroyed. The echoes of the continent's death cry still linger. Are we deceived? Is this illusion? Karul addressed the first elder who had spoken in his mind. Draconis, I too feel that death cry. Such pain, indeed, more dreadful in its aspect than that of the fallen one. If not a deception as our sister suggests, what has he done? We have stepped onto this land, and so all share what you sense, cruel. Draconis replied, I too am not certain of its truth. Sister, do you approach the High King's abode? The third voice spoke. I do, Brother Draconis. Would you and Brother Karul join me now that we may confront this mortal as one? We shall. Warrens opened, one to the far north, the other directly before Karul. The two elder gods joined their sister upon a ragged hilltop, 
where wind swirled through the ashes, spinning funereal reefs skyward. Directly before them, on a heap of burned bones, was a throne. The man seated upon it was smiling. As you can see, he rasped after a moment of scornful regard. I have prepared for your arrival. Oh yes, I knew you were coming. Jaconus of Tiam's kin, Karul, opener of the paths. His grey eyes swung to the third elder. And you, my dear, I was under the impression that you had abandoned your old self. Walking among the mortals, playing the role of middling sorceress. Such a deadly risk. Though perhaps this is what entices you so to the mortal game. You've stood on fields of battles, woman. One stray arrow. He slowly shook his head. We have come, Kalo, Karul said, to end your reign of terror. The man's brows rose. You would take from me all that I have worked so hard to achieve. Fifty years, dear rivals, to conquer an entire continent. Oh, perhaps our Dartha still held out. Always late in sending me my rightful tribute. But I ignored such petty gestures. She has fled, did you know? The bitch. Do you imagine yourselves the first to challenge me? The circle brought down a foreign god. I, the efforts went awry, thus sparing me the task of killing the fools with my own hand. And the fallen one? Well, he'll not recover for some time. And even then, do you truly imagine he'll accede to anyone's bidding? I would have. Enough. Draconis growled. Your prattling goes wearsome, Kalor. Very well. The High King sighed. He leaned forward. You've come to liberate my people from my tyrannical rule. Alas, I am not one to relinquish such things. Not to you, not to anyone. He settled back, waved a languid hand. Thus, what you would refuse me, I now refuse you. Though the truth was before Karul's eyes, he could not believe it. What have... Are you blind? Kalor shrieked, clutching at the arms of his throne. It is gone! They are gone! Break the chains, will you? Go ahead! No, I surrender them! Here, all about you is now free! Dust, bones, all free! You have in truth incinerated an entire continent. The sister elder whispered. Chikuraku. It is more and never again shall be. What I have unleashed will never heal. Do you understand me? Never! And it is all your fault. Yours! Paved in bone and ash, this noble road you chose to walk, your road! We cannot allow this. It is done, you foolish woman! Karul spoke within the minds of his kin. It must done. I will fashion a, a place for this within myself. A warren to hold all this? Draconis asked in horror. My brother. No, it must be done. Join with me now. This shaping will not be easy. 
It'll break you, Karul. His sister said. There must be another way. None. To leave this continent as it is. No. This world is young. To carry such a scar. What of Kalor? Draconis inquired. What of this? This creature? We mock him. Karul replied. We know his deepest desire. Do we not? And the span of his life. Long, my friends. Agreed. Karul blinked, fixed his dark, heavy eyes on the High King. For this crime, Kalor, we deliver appropriate punishment. Know this, you, Kalor, Idoran, Tazfesula, shall know mortal life unending. Mortal in the ravages of age, in the pain of wounds, and the anguish of despair, in dreams brought to ruin, in love withered, in the shadow of death's spectre, ever a threat to end what you will not relinquish. Jaconis spoke. Calor, Adrian, Tithesula, you shall never ascend. Their sister said, Calor, Adrian, Tithesula, each time you rise, you shall then fall. All that you achieve shall turn to dust in your hands, as you have willfully done here. So it shall be in turn visited upon all that you do. Three voices curse you. Karul intoned. It is done! The man on the throne trembled. His lips drew back in a rictus snarl. I shall break you! Each of you! I swear this upon the bones of twelve million sacrifices! Karil, you shall fade from the world! You shall be forgotten! Draconis, what you create shall be turned upon you! And as for you, woman, and human hands shall tear your body into pieces upon a field of battle, yet you shall know no respite. Thus, my curse upon you, sister of cold night. Kalor, Eideron, Tazvesula, one voice has spoken three curses. Thus! They left Kalor upon his throne, upon its heap of bones. They merged their power to draw chains around a continent of slaughter, then pulled it into a warren created for that sole purpose, leaving the land itself bared to heal. The effort left Karul broken, bearing wounds he knew he would carry for all his existence. More, he could already feel the twilight of his worship, the blight of Kalor's curse. To his surprise, the loss pained him less than he would have imagined. The three stood at the portal of the nascent, eternally lifeless realm and looked upon their handiwork. Then Draconis spoke. I am forging a sword. Karul and the Sister of Cold Knights nodded, for this was known to them both. The power I have invested possesses a... a finality. Then, Karul whispered, You must make alterations in the final shaping. So it seems I shall need to think long on this. After a long moment, Karul and his brother turned to their sister. She shrugged. I shall endeavour to guard myself. When my destruction comes, it will be through betrayal and naught else. There could be no precaution against such a thing, lest my life become its own nightmare of suspicion and mistrust. To this I shall not surrender. Until that moment, I shall continue to play the mortal game. Careful, then, Karul murmured, whom you choose to fight for. Find a companion, Draconis advised. A worthy one. Wise words from you both. I thank you. There was nothing more to be said. 
the three had come together with an intent they had now achieved. Perhaps not in the manner they would have wished, but it was done, and the price had been paid. Willingly. Three lives and one, each destroyed. For the one, the beginning of eternal hatred. For the three, a fair exchange. Elder gods, it has been said, embodied a host of unpleasantries. In the distance, the beast watched the three figures part ways. Riven with pain, white fur stained and dripping blood, the gouged pit of its lost eye glittering wet, it held its hulking mass on trembling legs. It longed for death, but death would not come. It longed for vengeance, but those who had wounded it were dead. There but remained the man seated on the throne, the one who had laid waste to the beast's home. Time enough for the settling of that score. A final longing filled the creature's ravaged soul. Somewhere, amidst the conflagration of the fall and the chaos that followed, it had lost its bait and was now alone. Perhaps she still lived. Perhaps she wandered, wounded as he was, searching the broken wastes for a sign of him. Or perhaps she had fled in pain and terror to the warren that had given fire to her spirit. Wherever she had gone, assuming she still lived, he would find her. The three distant figures unveiled warrens, each vanishing into their elder realms. The beast elected to follow none of them. They were young entities as far as he and his mates were concerned, and the warren she might have fled to was, in comparison to those of the elder gods, ancient. The path that awaited him was perilous, and he knew fear in his labouring heart. The portal that opened before him revealed a grey street, swirling storm of power. The beast hesitated, then strode into it, and was gone.